in their way through the congregation. This teaching, if you are new to it or haven't been in a while, we use a book called Harmony of the Gospels uh, by A.T. Robertson. It's an old book, but it's an oldie but goodie as it takes and harmonizes the Gospels. And what that means is there's concept within the Gospels in a presentation style that takes the very message of the Gospels and summarizes it. For instance, tonight we're in, what are we in, paragraph, who's with me? Paragraph 47, we're talking about Messiah's authority over man. And this uh, correlates to, to uh, paragraph 47 in your teaching, the call of Matthew, Levi, and his reception in honor of Yeshua. Remember, Matthew was a publican. He was a tax collector. He was a man who heard two words, fascinating two words. Two words spoken to him, and he got up and he left everything behind. The words were, follow me. How many of you would be willing to leave your vocation, to leave your home, to leave your family, to leave your source of wealth, to leave your source of income by the instruction of two words, follow me? But if you knew in the bigger picture and the supernatural that the words being spoken to you were the fulfillment of a prophecy given by Moses who said, one will come after me, you are to follow him and do everything he instructs you to do, otherwise you'll be cut off from your people, then those words would resonate in your ear and you would do exactly that, you would follow him. Yeshua spoke those words to Peter, he spoke those words to, to uh, Matthew, Levi. So as we read this and uh, if you have the text, the text I think is in King James. I'm not a very good there and thouer, so I'm going to read it from the NIV. Uh, but if you want to read along on page 39 in paragraph 47, uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Messiah's authority over man. Now, we're in this study at this point in time. We've talked about Messiah's ability, authority to forgive sin, Messiah's authority over defilement, his authority over nature, his authority to preach, his authority over disease, his authority over demons. And we do a, a fairly uh, thorough job of examining Messiah's authority, not because we're so fascinated by his authority, but we want to weigh into the call on our lives. In John 14 and 12, Messiah clearly said, anyone who has faith in me can do everything that I've done. In fact, you'll do even greater than this. In Luke 10, 18, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I give you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing whatsoever shall harm you. Well, when you talk about that authority, what is that authority? What is the depth? What is the breadth? What is the length and the height of that authority? If all authority is given to us because of our faith in Messiah Yeshua, what does that release us to do in our lives? What do we have dominion over? God prophesied over Adam. He gave man dominion over the earth and dominion over all things that had a name. Do we actually walk in that? So when we dissect Messiah's authority by examining the Gospels and we take a look at the harmonizing of the Gospels and we see that there's no contradictions in the Word of God, but there's supportive evidence that by the testimony of two or more, something would be established. When we see that established, then we know that it is God-breathed, it is ordained by God, it is true, it is truly inspired, and it's at the will of the Father. Remember, Yeshua declared that I and the Father are one. The Father is in me and I am in him. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. So he's showing us that it can happen, that there can be this abiding in God and this power and authority, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. And the power and the anointing of our lives is when we speak through the Holy Spirit. How many of you can determine, even as you watch me and interact with me when I'm talking in the flesh and when I'm, when I'm speaking in the anointing? All right, my wife can. The anointing breaks the yoke. When you hear chains falling off of people's lives here when I'm preaching a message, you know that that's the anointing of God. All right, when we're walking down the street and we're yucking it up, and thinking, that's the flesh, and that's okay. I'm a human being. I'm not the Messiah. But he spoke in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and therefore he had dominion over all these things. And you too, when you walk and speak through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the way God did when he spoke, creation into being, when he did, when he confirmed the Messiahship of Yeshua, when it says that I saw the Spirit like a dove light upon him, and then God spoke and said, this is my son, in him I am well pleased. This was through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and so we have this pattern. Very hard for us to understand 
how much is being given to us. So when we look at this, when we take the Gospels and we overlay them one upon the other, we intersect them, we see the common ground in which they speak. We can begin to weigh into the very messages of this teaching. You know, I'll go back to the very beginning and, and, and tell you to continue to weigh into the themes. There are four themes of the gospel, four gospels. And you say, well, why do we need four gospels? The gospels were written to a particular audience. And in that audience, there was a particular theme of each gospel. Matthew's, Matthew, Matthew's theme was Yeshua, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And so he quotes the old covenant scriptures because when I minister, most often I'll quote from Matthew. Matthew 5, 17. I quote the various things from Matthew because therefore the, the preaching and the reaching of my Jewish brothers and sisters. When I'm talking about healing and the power of, of uh, the Messiah, uh, I look at, at Luke's theme, Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of Man. Son of Man, meaning one of us, and that we can weigh into this power and this authority that we have. So when we're breaking strongholds, it's Luke, Luke, Luke. Mark's theme, Yeshua the Messiah, the servant of Adonai, the servant of God. And so when we talk about the servant messages, we most often quote Mark. And then John's theme, Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of God, when we're going to clearly establish the Messiahship of Yeshua as the Son of God. What's the most often quoted scripture, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. And it clearly establishes that theme going forward is to show him as the Son of God. And so the authors are true to their theme. So if it didn't support their theme, they didn't necessarily talk about this particular miracle or this particular event or this particular period of his life. And when you do that, you have to understand that when you put the Gospels together, you have the perfect picture beginning to end, birth, life, death, resurrection, and return of the Messiah. You have this perfect picture of the Gospels. And so it's very important that we understand this, and when we weigh into the harmonizing of the Gospels, we see there's no contradiction. So tonight we're going to begin with chapter 47 in your text, and this is Messiah's authority over man. We're going to start with Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Mark chapter 2, 13 through 17. Once again, Yeshua went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Yeshua told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Yeshua was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teacher of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, what do, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Yeshua said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. As we look in Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. As Yeshua went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Yeshua was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Yeshua said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And then we look in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. After this, Yeshua went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. Follow me, Yeshua said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Yeshua at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and other Pharisees, others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Yeshua answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." It's an important message. It goes on to, let's see, Matthew, let's see. Uh, nope, I think that covers it, yes? All right. 
Matthew Levi was a publican, an occupation forbidden under Jewish law. Publicans were estranged from the Jewish community. They could not serve as a witness in a legal proceeding because they were considered to be sinners. A publican was either a tax collector or a customs official. Matthew, as a customs official, the worst of the two from the standpoint of Jewish society. He collected custom taxes for Rome and added to them by raising the assessment to include a profit for him. In Hebrew, his name means gift from God, Matthew or Levi, I'm sorry, a seemingly ironic contradiction in his profession before being called to discipleship by Yeshua. Understand this concept of tax collection in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem has 12 gates. Matthew had responsibility and the franchise ownership of all Jerusalem. This was done through a bidding process with Rome where you guaranteed them that you would take in a certain amount of money. Anything over that guarantee was yours to keep. Quite a bit of wealth. Each one of the people that worked for him was paid a wage. They too could have a commission incentive plan and charge more at their various gate. He got a piece of that action too. So he was like the McDonald's franchise of all of Jerusalem. Everybody had to pass through the gate. Everybody had to pay a tax. This was very, very significant revenue. We have a question up here, Art. Very significant revenue. And so in this significant revenue stream, understand that his position was he was rejected by the Jewish population. Hold the question for just a minute. He was rejected by the Jewish population. He was a friend of Rome, but because he was Jewish, he was still an enemy of Rome. So he was really neither fish nor fowl. He didn't fit into either. So who would he associate with? The people that he had authority over, other people in his profession, yes, that would be his, his, uh, his associates who didn't fit into the Jewish community, didn't fit into Rome. Question. The frequency of the tax, was it every time you went through the gate or once a week, once a month? Uh, how often did you pay that tax? That would be a question for Matthew. Good point. (laughs) The uh, tax was levied uh, as you made entrance into Jerusalem. Usually your commerce was done while you were in there, right? Uh, You paid the half-shekel temple tax if you were going to the temple. But as you entered the gates of Jerusalem, this commerce was there. Yes, Linda Jo? Um. Is there an extra biblical source that tells us that Matthew was the head tax collector of all the 12 gates? Uh, If you read Josephus, I think there's some references in Josephus. uh, As we did a study into the life and times that uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum did, a a pretty in-depth study of the life and times of the Jewish Messiah, uh, you'll see a number of references to the fact that he was considered like the kingpin. He was really the guy that had had, uh, control over this and then the rest of the people, uh, which makes sense as to why Yeshua would call him. Okay, because if he if he would follow, and remember that in Jewish life growing up, he was he wasn't born a tax collector. You got a question over here. He wasn't born a tax collector, so he would have studied like all young Jewish boys. He would have known scripture, he would have understood the promises of God, he would have understood the the Torah, and it was clearly in Torah that Moses made this declaration. Yes? Um, his last, well, it may not be his last name, but Levi, did it, did it have something to do with his lineage as far as him serving in the temple? Was he supposed to serve there? He was. He was a, he was a, a Levi, Levi son of Alphaeus, so he was mm-hmm. Levi ben Alphaeus, and uh, Levi was a, a common name for a Levite, and so he would have been from a line that that's why he would have been so studied. And so when, when the Messiah spoke to him, so you have to understand that, that the, uh, the mindset of Jerusalem at the time of Messiah, okay, there were many, many teachings going on. You had the Pharisees that believed in the Torah and were very legalistic. They were the control point for everything. If you want an opinion, You'd go to them, and they'd tell you what your opinion should be. You had the Pharisees that believed in the resurrection. They believed in the, in the law and the prophets. You had the Sadducees that believed in the law only. 
not in resurrection and not in the prophetic writing. If you see denominations of Christianity today that don't believe in the prophecy, everything was old and busted and that was then and this is now and none of this could have existed, that was way back then and that's the end of that. You had the Zealots, you had the Essenes, you had a society that was searching for the Messiah. You had a people that were being oppressed. Rome was oppressive. Now, remember that the Ottoman Empire, that, that there had been many, many times in which Israel, uh, the various kings over Israel, uh, the dispersion of Israel, Jerusalem falling into the hands, uh, moving out to Nebuchadnezzar, you had, had so many different rulers, and now finally you had the temple restored, you had the second temple, you have the ability for them to have a place of worship, a place to do sacrifices, and now you have this time in which this man is walking and word is spreading. Think about how word spreads. Look, when we came to Birmingham, we didn't know a single person, 2007. All right, now we run about 700 a week. Okay? That's from nothing in five years to that number through word of mouth. Okay? Word spreads, word spreads, word spreads. People bring friends. That's why we always say bring a friend. Sheep are stri- so as things move out in the community, oh, yes, yeah, I heard of you. Oh, yeah, I've heard of what you're doing there. Bethlehem, oh, yeah, um, we know about that. Okay? Word spreads. Well, in the life and times of Messiah, word was it. This was, you had people going from, from town to town. You also had pilgrimages. Three times a year, all the Jewish people from the surrounding area came into Jerusalem. This is why Acts chapter 2, you had so many people in Jerusalem because it was Shavuot, it was Pentecost, it was the 50th day after Passover. You had people there for Passover. It's why when you see the life and times of Messiah, you see him in the city during the Feast of Tabernacles. You see him there for Passover and you see him there for Shavuot. Why? Because he was an observant Jew. He was fulfilling his obligation under Leviticus 23 to make these pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And so he was doing his part. So people, he was the buzz. Okay? And now he speaks these two words. He has this following. The people, you can recognize this following. And so when he calls Levi, and who did he strategically pick? He strategically picked his disciples, what we might not think of captains of industry, but our perception is way off. We think that fishermen are uh, the deadliest catch. It's those guys, you know, snaggletooth, uh, drinking all night, uh, tattoos up and down every arm, uh, can't do anything else, so they make $100,000 and then get drunk and get in fights and die early and have heart disease and all these things. And we think a fisherman is the lowliest level position that there is. But that's not true. Fishermen in the life and times of Messiah had responsibility for the Galilee. They had responsibility for boats. They had responsibility for the livelihood of people that worked for them. They had to gather the fish. They had to prepare the fish. They had to take care of the nets. They had to take care of the boats. And then they had to sell the fish. They had to have relationships with people to be able to buy and sell, to be able to barter, to be able to move in the community. They had to be able to keep accountings. They had to pay their people, pay wages. They had commerce. They had business. They, were, they had sickle. They had, had some real smarts about them. Okay, we seem to think it's a whole different business today, but at that time, it was the, in the life and times of Messiah, this was an important part of commerce. You provided the food and the livelihood for many, many people. When you see how many fishermen, when you go out on the Galilee and you see how many fishing boats are there, still to this day, the Canary, Lake Canary is fished. The uh, St. Peter fish comes out of there uh, that they serve with the eyes in it. I don't think we like it like that, do we? Well, I like it like that. Sally, did you like it like that? No, she didn't like it like that. She says she doesn't want to look at any food that can look at her back. <laughs> That's what I say about tongue. I don't want to taste any food that can taste me back. But tongue is very good when it's prepared, but not when it's being prepared. <laughs> I have my standards. All right, Matthew answers Yeshua's call and recognized his authority over that of Rome and became the seventh disciple. By his very words, follow me. By the people that followed him, he recognized him as being a higher authority than Rome. Rome is who paid him. There's no greater authority than the one who pays you, right? You're supposed to submit to your master. You're supposed to pay for those people in authority. I mean, God clearly says that the one who pays you your wages, you are to be submitted to. There's a lot of many, many lessons in there. And he was submitted to Rome. This is who paid his wages. And he got up and he walked away from it. Do you have any idea of the wealth he left? In today's terms, he left millions on the table. Millions. 
This was a job you had pretty much for life. You kept rebidding it, but as long as you had the favor of Rome, you didn't lose this position. You were it. You became trusted. You turned in the money that was due. This is all you had to do. Yeshua spoke against this by saying you charge. They said, well, what do we need to do? They said to the tax collector, just, just charge what's owed. Don't take extra. Remember, this was a zing. This was a message because this was the pattern of life. These were the, the people that you had to pay to get in. These were the maitre d's of Jerusalem. You know, you had to slip in a little extra to get a good table. Upon following Yeshua and being born again, he gave himself a new birth, birthday party attended by Yeshua and the other six disciples. The Pharisees said that he ate and drank with publicans and sinners, prostitutes. Usually the reference to sinners was prostitutes. You had thieves and prostitutes. When you talked about the other side, when you were talked about the other side of the boat, he was referring to where he said, look, we're not catching any fish on the right side. He said, fish from the other side. Okay, well, that's where the sinners were. He clearly said, I didn't come for the righteous, I came for the sinners. When he said to them, let's go to the other side of the Galilee, he was leaving the righteous going to the sinners. He was moving into an environment where the thieves were, where, where life was rough. These were the tough guys. And so when you understand this, when he, when he was going out there, he said, look, in order for you to walk with me, sure, come into faith with me and keep your job. I understand your job, but now just, just charge what, you know, if it's a half shekel, just charge the half shekel. That's it. Yeshua responds to their thoughts and questions by saying three things. One, the sick need healing, not the healthy. Those who think they are righteous. The Pharisees thought that Matthew was on a par with a sick person, one cursed by God. Why? Because he took advantage in their mind of the Jewish population and took from them what would provide for their ability to do what? Pay it to the Pharisees. See, if you were supposed to bring a tenth to what? The temple. And it was eating into that. You know, they didn't have net and gross and withholding and IRAs and 401ks and all that. It was just a day's wages. And so eating into the, the, uh, the piggy bank, eating into the source of income, Number two, the Pharisees are concerned with making public their sacrifice, not with mercy, the greater quality of the law keeping. You remember, obedience is better than sacrifice. He's saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't want mercy. I don't want sacrifice. I want mercy. You mistreat people. You do things that are, are in the public eye. You stand there and you pray and you make long prayers and big dissertations so that you can get, look at the robes that they wore and the attire. It's the same way when you look on TV and you see the, the high priest and the, the uh, Byzantine priests, uh, the, the uh, old order of uh, the, that wear the long robes and the head coverings and the miters, and you see the Greek Orthodox, you see these big things going on on television, right, and you see that person walking down the street, you're going, well, he certainly has drawn a lot of attention to himself. Right? We would say the same things of the Hasidic Jews who walk down the streets with their black hats and their black coats and they're drawing attention to themselves. They're easily to recognize. They have the peyote, the payas, the curly hair. Okay? They're doing things. Are they doing that because they're clearly establishing they're set apart. Most people don't talk to them. That's how set apart they've become. And so if you're in the business world and you're talking to them, first of all, if you're a woman, they won't have anything to do with you. Okay? It's not a woman's world in the Hasidic environment. Okay, it's an old world biblical environment, old world, world Jewish standard. And so they try to are, remain obedient, but imagine wearing those heavy coats in winter, in summertime, how hot it must be. Okay, but their purification process is weekly, not daily. They have a different standard for how, what we consider standard. It's a very different world, very much set apart. The Lubavitchers have uh, many, many children. Uh, all large families living together, mother, father, grandparents, great-grandparents, many, many in a community lifestyle, very reminiscent of the old world, old Eastern European type of uh, shtetl or, um, you know, what's become the, 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 was the model of kibbutz or moshav in Israel. Number three, the Pharisees considered themselves be, be, themselves to be righteous before God. Yeshua is calling the sinners to himself, those who don't consider themselves righteous. See, if you think you're righteous, I think that I just did an, an acronym, Laura, what was it? 
Um, uh, I have to get it off my desk, but it's perceived righteousness is destructive error for pride. P-R-I-D-E. Perceived righteousness is destructive error. You think you're righteous, that's destructive error. Okay? Thinking that you're without sin, that you're righteous, makes God a liar. So people who think, well, I'm, I'm obedient to this, and I don't eat pork, and I don't eat shellfish, and I do this, this, and this, perceived righteousness is destructive error. That's pride. Spiritual pride is just as deadly and just as debilitating as any other kind of pride. So them declaring their righteousness, saying, why, well, we're righteous before God, we do all these things, remember the accusations that come down on them. You wash the outside of the cup, but it's the inside of the cup. You do these things, but it's this. You do this, but it's that. And he clearly established for them why they were not clean. So the Messiah had authority over tradition. Now, understand something. Tradition, which is not prohibited in Scripture, is perfectly wonderful. For example, as tradition we light two Shabbat candles. It's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell you you have to do this. It's tradition. But the Bible does not tell you that when you have your Shabbat service before the beginning of Shabbat, you should not light two candles. It's not prohibited. It's an expression, symbolic, of the greater light, the lesser light, that a woman lights the candles because a woman ushered in the Messiah. There's so many traditional things associated with it. So there's things we do which are traditional not prohibited by Scripture. In a biblical congregation, we go by the Word of God. So those things which we enjoy here from a traditional perspective, but tradition which was an outcropping of the law that became a law unto itself, Yeshua then takes authority over. And his issue was not against the law. He clearly said, Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Meaning, the written word of God. Many, many times in the book of Deuteronomy and many times in the book of Joshua, the reference to all that was given to Moses was shared with the children of Israel. All. Everything that was told to him and everything that was written down was shared. Moses called to an assembly all the children of Israel before his death and read to them all, and the scripture is very clear, it says all that God gave to him on Mount Sinai. Joshua, one of the very first things Joshua did after Moses died was call the children together, children of Israel together, and read to them all. So there is no justification or support scripturally in Torah for there to be any other law than the law of God. So the oral law, the oral tradition, is not identified. Saying that the rabbis say that, that there is another set of laws called the oral law, is not supported in Scripture. I've preached on it, I've taught on it. As you examine the Word of God, you see that all that was given to Moses, if all of it was given to Moses, we'd have it, and we do have it. It's interesting that every Torah that exists today that's considered to be a safer, S-E-F-E-R, safer Torah, one that is signed off on by a rabbi, it doesn't have to be kosher, meaning it's not all done on, but all that's considered a safer Torah has every jot and tittle, every word, every letter, it's the exact same number of letters in every Torah that we own and every Torah that exists out there, which is considered to be a legitimate, bona fide, certified Torah. And has been that way for hundreds and thousands of years. Why? Because it has not changed. The Word of God does not change. But what about the translations? Well, Hebrew is Hebrew. See, the nice part about Hebrew is Hebrew doesn't change. Hebrew is Hebrew. So when it was written in Hebrew, it's still written in Hebrew. It's still the same as it is and it was and will forever be. How many of you know that Hebrew is a pure language? You cannot curse in Hebrew. You have to leave Hebrew and go to another language. So the language of heaven will be a pure language, yes? Well, what language do you think it'll be? Hebrew. (laughs) So Messiah has has authority over tradition. We read in paragraph 48, Yeshua in three parables defends his disciples for feasting instead of fasting. 
fasting tradition. Yes, okay, there are fast days, but there are also feast days. He talks about the feasting, and he gives references to the bride. Now, it's interesting today, earlier today, I talked about the fact that, that uh, God calls Israel his bride, yes? So how many of you believe that God would divorce Israel and marry the church? Doesn't it say in Scripture, God hates divorce? Well, if God hates divorce, why would he divorce Israel and marry the church? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? So for all you replacement theologists out there, take a little bite of that one and see how it chews. All right, Messiah's authority over tradition, starting in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 18 through 22. Mark chapter 2, 18 to 22. That once they left their nets and followed him, he was talking to uh, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. He said, come follow me, and they left their nets and followed him. I'm sorry, that's 1, 2, 18. Now John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Yeshua, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Yeshua answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. We read in Matthew nine fourteen to 17, Matthew 9, 14 to 17. In the NIV it reads, the, Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Yeshua answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And then we read in Luke 5, 33, in regards to the same event, we're beginning to see a pattern of confirmation. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Yeshua answered, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for he says the old is better. So the real point of the conflict between the Yeshua and the Pharisees was the oral law, and the place of exaltation had been given by the religious authorities. The oral law was equal with the Torah in their minds. This was a pharisaical error. This was a sadducical error. Yes, Ashley. Hello. Okay. This is a question and concern with the church and Israel, the statement that you made. Um, I have a question about that. If, yes, I agree with that. He does not like divorce, and that makes sense. However, in my thinking, I'm thinking the church and Israel, are they not one since we are grafted in, and a church is a body of people, not a place Oh, I would love to think that that was, that was correct and that those who believed in the Jewish Messiah were grafted in, but what about those that believe in the Jewish Messiah and said that he divorced Israel and, and married the church? You see, that's a house divided against itself and it cannot stand. See, this is an anti-Semitic theology that says that we're going to take the Messiah, but we're not going to take the Jewishness of it. Oh, I got you. You see, that's replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel. Right. Not grafted in. Oh, we've got, we're, yeah, we're, we, what we did was the inheritance has now left this one group, and now it's coming to us. They're not sharing in it. 
Okay? They're, they're taking it. And it's because they don't understand the seven covenants of God. And the seven covenants of God, as I teach it, is he made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with, Mos- with Abraham, then with Moses, then with David. Jeremiah 31 is with Israel, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And then John 3.16 is a covenant with all mankind. Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay, makes sense? Mm-hmm. All right, so, so the covenant with Israel was now being able to be shared with all mankind. That now you're going to be grafted into this covenant. This covenant, to, one covenant didn't replace it, built upon. Never one time did he say that I'm going to take a new law and put it in your minds. Okay, and it will be in your hearts. He said, I will take my law that was written on tablets of stone and I will put that in your mind. Therefore, this covenant with Israel is irrevocable. Okay, but what you're talking about makes sense, great sense to me. Yes, if you're grafted into it, baby, you're grafted in. But if you're hijacking it, all right, remember you have a separation of the wheat and the chaff. Let me assure you on that day they will be chaff. They will not be wheat. It's an anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish theology that says, and let me, let me just throw it in there so that you can all flip out and then go home and ponder it yourselves. But part of my view of the doctrine of the rapture is an anti-Semitic theology, that all the believers will be sucked up, and then those Jews that will be left behind that don't believe in the Messiah, boy, then they're going to really get what they got coming to them for rejecting him. Think about it. It's 200 years old, and think about the birth of all new theologies that came out in the last 200 years. There's an undercurrent in there of anti-Semitic theology. Okay? This whole thing about Israel, and you have to understand that the Arab nations, the promises to the Arab nations, pick up the CD from today, the, the promises to the 12 kingdoms of the Arab nations of Ishmael have been fulfilled. The promise to the one, the one promise to Israel has not why is it okay that 12 are fulfilled, but one is not? This is the world's outcry. Oh, look what they're doing, those poor. Look, you got family, okay, from Ramallah. Okay, you married into the Bajaya family. You know, and what they're telling you is true from part of your family. The other side of the family, yeah, we don't know about that, okay? <laughs> but the Bajayas are cool. We, we're, we're standing with the Bajayas. Right. You, you like them. There you go. There you go. But, uh, you know, if you have questions about that, uh, if you know Pastor Esau, Bajalia, okay, that's Ashley's brother-in-law, uh, asked somebody who's from that area and uh, considers himself to be from a Palestinian background, but not looking for uh, uh, their Zionist be- believing in the land of Israel as opposed to the anti-Zionist side of it. There are factions within, just like there are factions with anybody. So Yeshua's conflict with them was the place of exaltation that the oral law was given on a par with Torah. It's the same thing that's happened with Talmud. Talmud is a representation of the oral law. This is the commentary on Torah. How many of you been, know about these, that, that uh, to be kosher means that you can't have a cheeseburger? How many of you have heard that you can't mix milk and meat? Okay, that's not biblical. That's Talmudic. Okay, that's part of the oral tradition. Ask yourself this question, when God was surrounded by the two angels and walked into Abraham's tent, what did Abraham say? Slaughter the best calf and bring me some milk. We're having cheeseburgers tonight. Okay? We're having hamburgers and milkshakes. Come on, bring it on. That's what he served God, milk and meat. Now, the rabbis will teach you, well, there was an hour difference in time, and the digestion, the enzymes were separated, and they're going to teach you all this, but were they there? It's not, doesn't support what the Word of God says. Now, he says, don't boil a calf in its mother's milk. Now, these fence laws are put around it from a Talmudic standpoint for the protection of the people to never violate that law, but what's the chance of you using milk today to boil a piece of meat? How many people boil milk? Veal, make veal. Okay, it was an old recipe. You used to boil the veal in the milk. Okay, well, that was a preparation method not used often in the believing world. Okay, that was a, very much a paganistic tradition. Okay, it was like boiling a baby in its mother's milk. Okay, very, very offensive. Offensive to all of us to even ponder this. Well, this was the answer to how you could avoid that happening, is to never mix milk. So I told you the story the other night about the uh, spiritually proud person that had five sets of dishes. They had a set of uh, regular daily dairy 
and meat dishes, which is very normal. Then they had a separate set of Passover dishes, dairy and meat, and then they have a fifth set of dishes. And the rabbi asked them, why do you have the fifth set of dishes? And they said, that's for pork and shellfish. <laughs> Can take it to the point of ridiculous. After the return from the Babylonian captivity, Ezra founded the school of the Sophorim, the scribes, to expound upon the 613 commandments of the Torah and kept the people from breaking them and going back into captivity, Hosea 4 and 3. The school of the Sophorim lasted from Ezra to Hillel in 30 AD. Now, I was raised in a Hillel teaching environment. We had a Hillel academy in Pittsburgh. When you look and visit, you, you see Hillel is all over the world. It is a, a, a teaching method. It is Rabbi Hillel. It is... Uh, uh, on a par with Rabbi Kiva, uh, Maimonides, there's many, many great rabbis and brilliant men, brilliant men. But there's been many brilliant men. You know, Socrates, you remember Socrates? Oh yeah, Socrates, you, you might call him Socrates, Socrates. Uh, but you had, you had these great philosophers and you had these great writers and you have great many choices, and oh, well, I'm a this, and I'm a that, and there's many people that, are, that follow Darwin, and, and there's a lot of error there, and there's those that follow Calvin, and, and you know, they, they weigh into this set of rules and regulations, there are those that follow uh, Luther, and there's this set of rules and regulations, but those are men followers. Uh, denominations are exchanging one set of rules for another set of rules. And if we weigh into this, we see that what they did was they took the laws of Torah and they replaced them with other laws. They said, this is the only way you can do this. This is the only way you can do that. And if you're going to be a part of this community, you have to do things this way. Okay? You can't have alcohol. You can't have this. You can't have that. There's no, I know there's denominations of Christianity that there's no musical instruments on Sunday. But you can have them on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Okay? As if there was some biblical mandate that you had to make music in your heart on Sunday, but on other days you could use an instrument. Okay? or that there was no prophecy, or there were no miracles. So we have people from those congregations come to Beth Hillel for prayer because they can't get a miracle prayer in their congregation, but they can get one here. Well, let me tell you something. When you have cancer, okay, your denomination doesn't support laying on of hands and the anointing with all. You're going to seek out, rather than die in your denomination, you're going to live in the body of Messiah. And so people get set free. So what we've done is we have the, the segregation, if you will, into denominations, and now you have these sets of rules. Denominational Christianity is denominations really believing this is your membership, these are your bylaws, these are your bylaws, these are your bylaws. That's why Bethlehem only has three rules. Anybody know what those three rules are? One, that you're a believer in Messiah, because that's pretty darn important to be a part of this congregation. Actually, it's a non-negotiable requirement. Two, you will support yourself to the unity of the body and not sow seeds of discord and disunity. And number three, you will keep your life in order, meaning your God first, then your family, then your work and your congregation. A house that's not in that order is a house out of order, and we promote that, meaning if you have a kid's baseball game to go to, well, Rabbi, do I miss Shabbat service to go support my family? When you became a member of Beth Hillel, now, if you pulled your family out of it and they're starving spiritually and you don't have balance in your life, that's moving that God out of his rightful place and baseball's become your new God. But as long as you have your house in order, we're going to support you in that. That's the requirements of Congregation Bethlehem to be an active member here. That's it, to be faithful with your time, your tithe, and your talent. Period. The three T's. Sally. Just to give witness to what Rabbi said about people coming here, we heard this week from somebody who's in a church um, who runs a wig shop for ladies who have cancer, and one of her clients who um, goes to an unnamed church um, could not get prayer at church, came here, received prayer from Rabbi, and her oncologist said, we cannot explain um, the uh, improvement in your diagnosis and your status, and we give God the glory for that. But it Amen. was great that she could come here, and that was reported to a group of people in a church. So they're listening. Yeah, it, happen it happens all the time. I, you know, I was telling Miss Laura that, that uh, today, I don't remember all the people I prayed for and all the stories that I'm told in these prayer lines and all these and where are you from and where do you go to church and what do you do? And I hear these things and, well, have you? And I always, the first thing I ask anybody that attends another church who's a member of a church, 
when they call me and they want counsel, well, have you spoken to your pastor? I don't tend another man's flock. Okay? I don't take care of other people's sheep. Okay? If you have a problem and you can't get the kind of through the, through the congregation you're a part of, you need to seek that first. All of you who are visiting here at Bethel El, you need to seek that first. That's in order. Okay? You can't serve two masters. Okay? Well, if you went to them for counsel, well, what was the outcome of that counsel? Why are you seeking additional counsel? Have you gone back to the person that gave you that counsel? That counsel is not working. What's not working about it? But don't seek counsel from me when you're a member of another congregation. Oh, well, you can't talk. No, you can't get an appointment with my pastor. What? I can't, a sheep can't talk to the shepherd. Well, I'm not going to make any comment other than right now. But if you can't talk to your pastor, then that's not a, that's not a, if, if, it's, if, if you don't have people in your congregation to go to in leadership to get prayer, uh, that wasn't the way God built things. Acts chapter 2 talks about how the congregation was built. They prayed together. They supported each other. They took care of each other. They had everything in common. That's not a hierarchy. That's an avail, needs to be availability. That's why my office is on the courtyard. Yeah, I counsel on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and uh, those are the days I have open for that. All right. The second generation of Sophorim went even further and developed many additional thousands of rules to construct a fence around the law of Moses to prevent future judgment from God. At this juncture, the principle of operation for the Sophorim was that a Sophor could disagree with a Sophor but not with the Torah. Majority vote determined which rules would be set for observance in Jewish life. For example, the boiling of a kid in his mother's milk, a Canaanite practice which ceased a thousand years earlier became a leading dietary principle which would become the oral law. By now it's around 450 B.C. The law was given around 1400 B.C. But the Sophorim developed extensive rules based on the off chance that eating meat and milk together might violate the Mosaic law. The Canaanites boiled the kid in its mother's milk and offering it as a sacrifice to Baal. God simply did not want the Israelites to have such practices as the idol worship of Canaanites. The Sophorim ruled that meals would be divided into dairy and non-dairy in order to prevent the remote possibility of having meat on a plate where milk or cheese may have been, two sets of dishes were necessary. The rule was even further refined. Majority ruled in decisions about what the Bible meant. There was a story, a Talmudic story, about Talmudic scholars. Couldn't agree. Two scholars could not agree. They called in another scholar. They now had three scholars to determine whether or not a lamb with one gray hair, one beige hair, was considered to have a blemish. Two of the rabbis said, no, he doesn't have a blemish. One rabbi said he does. They said, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll go to the Lord. Lord, we come to you. Two of us say he, has, he, he doesn't have a blemish. What do you say? I say he has a blemish. The rabbis look at each other and go, okay, it's tied two to two. Let's go get Saul. <laughs> this was the attitude of the rabbis. This is the attitude of the tribunal, the bait din, the ruling rabbis that judge, sit in judgment even today. And you read about these things. I'm having a lot of fun, but we've hit our time. 